Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'm glad that all of y'all made the sacrifice of giving up your Sunday afternoon nap and Dallas Cowboys football and playing golf on a beautiful fall afternoon and came here to the Ice House. That song you just heard is called How Do I Do It? And it comes from the very first Hank the Cowdog story. And uh, it tells you a lot about how Hank thinks of himself. He's telling you about himself. And uh, you may or may not know it, but when I first started writing Hank the Cowdog stories, I was working as a cowboy on a ranch in the Texas Panhandle, which we found out yesterday is 15 hours drive from Kingsville. <laughs> and you sure don't want to run out of gas between here and there. But uh, I was working on a ranch south of Perryton as a cowboy, and uh, there was a dog on that ranch named Drover, and there was a cat on that ranch named Pete. And I got the idea for doing a story about a dog, and I thought it would be fun. I had known a dog named Hank when I was working as a cowboy in Oklahoma. My neighbors had a dog. His name was Hank. He was an Australian Shepherd. And he, he was very sincere and golden-hearted. Oh, he was a good-hearted dog. He'd always come up, and uh, when we came in for lunch on uh, a hot spring day, old Hank would come running out to meet us. He was, his heart was so full of love, and he'd jump up on us. Only trouble was he had just been for a roll in the overflow of the septic tank. <laughs> And that was one of the things he did that made him not too popular with the cowboys. Another thing he did one time was uh, was a hired man on the ranch named Sammy Hager, and he didn't like Hank for some reason. We had just pinned about 400 head of cows and calves in the corral, and Hank decided that that was the time for him to show his stuff. So he ran out and barked at a cow. And she was a big old Orrin Herford cow, and she had a calf, and she turned around and came after old Hank. Well, he was no dummy. He ran and took cover behind the first thing he could find, which happened to be Sandy Hager. <laughs> he was walking along to, to uh, oh, get something out of the saddle room, I believe. Had his head down, wasn't looking, and old Hank ran right between his legs, and that cow gathered him up and put him on the ground and tried to get in his hip pocket. <laughs> Cracked a couple of his ribs, bruised him all over, and when he was telling me about this, he said something that's always stuck with me. He said, John, whatever hard hand needs is three stud horses, two cow dogs, and a big ringworm. <laughs> and so that was the dog that I had in mind when I wrote the first Hank story. A good dog very sincere in being head of ranch security, but he wasn't real smart. Well, I started doing these stories on cassette tape because I thought it would be fun to do the different voices. Now you all, you kids, know something about the Hank stories. You want me to do a few voices for you? Yeah. I don't know what I would have done if you'd said no. <laughs> all right, here's the first one. See if you can guess who this is. It's me again, Hank the Cow Dog. Now that one's pretty easy. <laughs> Nobody wants to guess? You're stumped? Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yeah, that was Hank. All right, who could this be? Oh, Hank, my leg just hurts so bad. I don't think I can go out in the cold. <laughs> who could that be? Who? Drover. Yes, that's Drover. Uh, all right, uh, who do you uh, this, uh, suppose uh, this might be? He ever uh, wants to be a uh, singer when he uh, 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 grows up. <laughs> who could it be? Junior the buzzer. Yes, I saw several juniors, several juniors' cousins out at the King Ranch this morning. We went out looking at the wildlife and uh, saw several of Junior's cousins out there. All right, well, let's see, who could this be? Hmm, hello, Hanky. What are you doing this morning? Who's that? Pete. 
Beat the barn cat, that's right. Well, anyway, I do the voices of the different characters on a cassette tape. And another thing that you can do on a cassette tape that you can't do on a book is bring in music. And I have always loved music. I grew up in a musical family and in a community where music was very important. It was not considered sissy to play in the band or to sing in the choir. And uh, so I like music, and I decided to bring music into the Hank stories. And that song we did was from the first Hank story. And we're going to do a program of mainly music from the Hank tapes. So now we're going to do one from the second Hank story. And this is one of my favorite characters in all the Hank series. In the second story, Hank is slapped across the nose by Pete the barn cat. And it brings little droplets of blood out on the soft, leathery portion of his nose. And you know, he's very concerned about that because he knows, he knows that the women really go for his nose. <laughs> so he looks out to the end of his nose to check the damage. And to see the end of your nose, you have to cross your eyes. And your mother has told you about that. And Hank's mother had warned him too, but he did it anyway, and sure enough, they did. <laughs> and they stayed crossed, and he couldn't get them uncrossed. And you all probably know, I'm sure Dr. John knows this, that this is a serious medical condition called eye crossorosis. <laughs> and I think that he even has to vaccinate his heifers against eye crossorosis. <laughs> anyway, there's only one cure for eye crossorosis. You have to go find a good witch who knows the proper riddles to cure it, and he does. She is a little burrowing owl, which is a kind of owl we have up in the Flat Plains country. Uh, they dig holes in the ground. No, they live in holes in the ground with prairie dogs. And uh, her name is Madame Moonshine, and she's a little owl, and she's a witch, and she has a song. We're going to do that one now. And this is Trev Tevis over here. He is from the same little community I'm from up in the Panhandle, Perryton. He is playing five synthesizers tied together. And that's pretty impressive in itself. But on this song, he is going to play the synthesizer and this marimba over here at the same time. That's, you don't believe it? No. He has very long arms. He is six feet five inches tall or five feet 17, as he sometimes says. <laughs> and he's gonna play them both at the same time, or maybe he will, we'll see if he can. So here's Madame Moonshine singing, I am a witch. <laughs>
You know, it's a pity that we don't have another song for Trev to play. We haul this that thing 937 miles all the way down here. Do you know another song on that thing? Just one. Just one? <laughs> you kids wouldn't want him to play another one on the marimba, would you? Would you? <clears throat> well, all right. I presume that this is that low-class American folk song called Chicken Reel. Yes. It's not much of a song, you'll be disappointed, but here is Chicken Reel. I told you it wasn't very good. <laughs> well, uh, I think we'll do one now from the seventh Hank story called The Curse of the Incredible Priceless Corn Cob. <laughs> In that story, Pete the Barn Cat convinces Hank that a smelly old corn cob is worth a fortune. Now, I don't have the time to tell you how he did that, but it was pretty sneaky. Well, Hank happens to have one in his possession, and he believes that he's become a wealthy dog. One of the ten wealthiest dogs in the United States. And it kind of goes to his head, and he does a lot of foolish things. One of the things he does is he quits his job, because he figures if he's all that rich, he, needs, he doesn't need a job. He needs to be going to a resort community to enjoy his fortune. So he takes his corn cob and leaves the ranch. <coughs> and as he is leaving the ranch, he does a song. This song is done in a style called bluegrass, which is what this banjo was intended for. This is a five-string banjo. And uh, it's played with two fingers and a thumb. And I wear steel finger picks on my fingers and a plastic thumb pick on my thumb. And... Uh, in a style developed by a man named Earl Scruggs from North Carolina back in the late 40s. 
and it's called bluegrass. So Matt is a style that will do this in. This is Hank singing. Are you ready, Maestro? Yeah, yeah. Here's Hank singing, I'm rich. And when I'm just playing the banjo and not singing, I want you all to clap in time with the music. That's important. It'll go a lot better if you don't get ahead of me or behind me. And when I start to sing, be quiet, don't clap, and listen to the words. You ready? Let's go.
these two little girls are out in the backyard playing dress up and beauty shop. And they have Pete the barn cat in a nightgown and drove her in a pair of striped overalls. Well, Hank is much too tough to play dress up and beauty shop with little girls. But he goes down just to watch. And he's sitting there by the yard gate watching. And this little blue-eyed nine-year-old girl named Ashley. It's an interesting coincidence, isn't it, that her name is Ashley and my little girl's name is Ashley, too. And she comes up to Hank and starts stroking his head. And he makes a big mistake. He looks into her eyes. And he falls in. And the next thing he knows, he's sitting in her beauty shop chair. <laughs> and she has her brush out. And she brushes his hair, and he looks into her eyes and hardly even notices that she has rolled his hair up in pink curls. <laughs> but by that time, he doesn't care because he has decided little gals are all right with him. And if you were listening to the tape at that point, you would hear Hank sing this song. Security. 
He has tried real hard to impress her. He's walked on his back legs. He's done flips. He's barked at cars. He's barked at airplanes. I mean, he's done everything a guy could do, and nothing has worked. But he runs in to these two Kyle brothers named Rip and Snort. And they teach him something that he never knew before, and which is very important. You boys need to learn this because you'll be going to the eighth grade prom one of these days. See, what the coyotes teach Hank is that if you really want to impress your girl, what you do is roll on a dead skunk. <laughs> Honest. Because the girls really go for that deep manly aroma. <laughs> so they, the coyotes teach this to Hank through a song called Rotten Meat. And we're going to do it. And your moms are going to be so proud of us when they hear us. <laughs> Let's do a chorus. I'll do a chorus and teach you the words, and then we'll try one together, and then we'll do the whole song. So listen to the words. They're very pretty. Rotten meat, rotten meat. The odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat, and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without rotten meat. Yeah. The guy has to go to a lot of lengths to impress girls in this world. All right, you got it? Let's try it. One, two. Rotten meat, rotten meat. The odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without... That's what I thought. You're all loping. You may have to stay after the program for two weeks. Now, you adults who don't have any reputations to rest, you know, veterinarians or something like that, you can go up, you can sing out with us. All right. This is, the singer is Snort the Coyote. He loves to sing and howl at the moon, and I saw him out at the King Ranch this morning. He ran across the road. He doesn't sing very well, though, so you'll have to forgive him. There's many a mystery got lost in our history, but none more important for us to repeat than this secret potion, this coyote love lotion, the wonderful essence of rock taking meat. Sing! Rock and meat, rock and meat, the odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without It's getting better. I know a feller, his coat is dark yellow. He's got sinus drainage and sneezes a lot. He had no success in the women department until he discovered the perfume of rot. Sing! Rotten meat, rotten meat. The odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without oh. Now they ask Hank to do a verse. The girl of my dreams is a wonderful lady. Miss Buell is her name and she makes my heart thump. It never occurred to me she might prefer me if I showed up smelling of decomposed skunk. Say, rotten meat, rotten meat, the odor's deliciously subtle and sweet. Coyotes love to cheat and we love to eat. This life would be rotten without Now Snort comes back. The secret of courtship and coyote circles depends on the deep manly smell of the guy. A woman worth courting wants guys who are sporting, who stink to high heaven and smell to the sky. We wear rotten meat, we share rotten meat, the aftershave lotion that's sure hard to beat. Coyotes always smell it, we've accomplished the feat of charming our women with Yes, very well.
Y'all did real well on that. That was just beautiful. <laughs> you know, we are approaching the Halloween season, and I happen to have a very scary ghost story. But I would hate to read it if any of you kids would have nightmares about it or you know, it, it's so scary. It's so scary you might even want to run out of the room. I don't know. It has ghosts and skeletons in it and a witch and a pirate. You think you can stand that? Alright, well we'll see. It's a it's the day. It's Halloween day. Pete the Barn Cat warns Hank that he had better be careful because Halloween is the scariest night of the year. That's when all the ghosts and goblins come out. Hank informs him that he doesn't believe in ghosts or goblins and he doesn't allow Halloween on his ranch. That evening, Hank and Grover are down at Slim the Cowboy's house. Darkness has fallen and they are out on night patrol when Drover comes running up and says that he has just seen a mysterious black car pull up in front of Slim's house. And out of that car climbed five strange creatures. And Hank says, what kind of creatures are we talking about, Drover? And he says, well, let me see. I think there were two skeletons and one ghost and a pirate and a witch. Well, Hank does not believe in ghosts or skeletons or witches, and he knows that no pirate could survive in the panhandle <laughs> because they require large amounts of water. So he doesn't believe the story. But, oh, yes, and one other thing. Grover says that they went up to the front door and they were they banged on the door, and they were yelling something about trees. Trees? What kind of trees? Well, let me think. Trigger trees. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Hank has been inside Slim's house. He knows that Slim has mice and mildew. But no trees. Something strange is going on, so he jumps the yard fence and he sits down in front of the porch and he's going to wait for whoever that is to come out. And that's where we're going to pick up the action. Off to my right, I heard Drover's front paws scratching on the fence. The runt still hadn't made it into the yard. Hurry up and get over here. There's no reason why it should take you five minutes to climb over a fence. Well, I just can't seem to make it, Hank. I guess my legs aren't as strong as yours. Would it be all right if I stayed out here? No, it wouldn't be all right. But if that's the best you can do, it's the best you can do. You're the one who has to live with yourself. Yeah, I wouldn't know where else to go. <laughs> Drover's yapping distracted me from my primary job, watching the front door. In other words, for a moment or two, I lost concentration. I didn't hear the front door open. I didn't hear footsteps on the porch. I didn't know that I was about to be attacked until I turned around and saw what I saw. I mean, it was so horrible, so frightening, so blood-chilling, that if I told the whole story, it might have a bad effect on the kids. You know me. I worry about the kids. I don't mind giving them a little thrill every now and then, but hey, when it comes to the real heavy-duty scary stuff, I don't know, it bothers me. What I'm saying is, if there's any kids in here who might have a bad reaction to heavy-duty, hardcore, scary stuff, you better get them out of here right now before this thing gets wild. Because it's fixing to get wild. 
You ready? Okay. Let me set the scene again. Dark night. Coyotes howling off in the distance. Only one coyote. <laughs> A whisper of wind sighing through the bare limbs of the cottonwoods. And behind me, the rumble of the motor of a mysterious black car. Just for a moment, I had allowed Drover to distract me. Then, I heard a sound to my left. It seemed to be coming from the porch. I turned my head and saw... Huh? How in smokes you won't believe this? Hang on, because here it comes. Two skeletons, one goat, one pirate, and a witch. Fellers, I still didn't believe in skeletons or ghosts, but there they were right in front of me. Well, my ears flew up just as though somebody had tied strings to them and gave the strings a yank. I mean, we're talking about ears that almost flew off my head. <laughs> my eyes popped open, and I think they even crossed. My lower jaw dropped a good six inches and my tongue fell another six inches beyond that. <laughs> the hair on my back stood straight up, and I mean every single hair from my eyebrows all the way out to the tip of my tail. Stood straight up, you'd have thought I was a porcupine. <laughs> Naturally, my first reaction to this nightmare was to bark. But when I tried to activate my barking mechanism, what I got was a squeak. Not a bark. Squeaking at goblins and skeletons is a poor response. But it was the best I could come up with on short notice. So I squeaked. Up to this point, I hadn't known whether these goblins were friendly or the dog-eating variety. But I soon found out. One of the skeletons saw me there, and at that very moment, he or she. In other words, I was running in place. <laughs> and I can reveal that my claws were throwing up sparks in the cement. And I mean showers of sparks that lit up the night. You've seen guys welding after dark? <laughs> Same deal. Sparks, brought fire, smoke, the whole nine yards. Well, the first skeleton had laid a curse on me with that poisonous magic word, and that would have been serious enough in itself. But just then, the other goblins came after me. The second skeleton had a mysterious paper bag in his left hand. Gripping it at the top, he or she raised it above his or her head and began shaking it. It contained something. Perhaps roots or magic herbs or even bones. Yes, they were bones. Say when skeletons go walking around, sometimes their bones fall off. <laughs> and they carry a paper sack to hold all the loose ones. When they get back home, or wherever it is that they, the skeletons go when they finish terrorizing people and dogs, when they get back home, they have to stick all the loose bones back in place. Otherwise, they would fall apart. <laughs> Well, there I was, spinning my tires, so to speak, on the cement, and being attacked by two skeletons. Serious enough, right? Well, you ain't heard it all yet. Suddenly, this little witch jumped off the porch. And in case you haven't been attacked by any witches lately, let me describe this one. She was dressed in black, had a nose as long as a carrot. <laughs> was missing two front teeth and wore a very strange kind of pointed hat on her, well, on her head, of course. In one hand, she carried an object that resembled a broom. In fact, it was a broom. <laughs> In her other hand, she carried a round orange object that resembled a pumpkin, but it was like no pumpkin I'd ever seen before. It was made of plastic, see? 
had a handle on it, and also a base. I know that sounds crazy, a pumpkin with a base, but this pumpkin, by George, had a base on it. Anyway, this little witch, I say little witch, but come to think of it, maybe she wasn't so little. Maybe she was pretty big. In fact, she was huge. This huge witch, she must have stood, oh, seven feet, three inches tall, biggest woman I'd ever seen. She jumped off the porch and yelled, Cricket freeze! At that very same moment, the ghost said, Woo! I described that ghost? Scariest thing I ever saw. No ears. No nose. No hair. Just two horrible eyes and a big round mouth. Oh, yes. And he was wearing tennis shoes. And then the pirate came after me, too. Description, little bitty short guy. Must have been a midget or a widget or whatever you call those short guys. Only this one was wearing a black patch over his eye. Had a big scar on the left side of his face. Terrible scar with blood still showing. And he carried his sword. And he was wearing tennis shoes, too. That was another interesting clue. A ghost and a pirate wearing tennis shoes. But... You might say that I wasn't in any position to put those two clues together and come up with a hypotenuse. I mean, I was under attack, fellas. It was time to do some serious life saving. One last thing about that pirate. When he jumped at me, he waved the sword and yelled those same two words about trees. Speaking of trees, it was time for this old dog to head for tall timber. But before I could get that deal accomplished, I had to endure one last shocker. Slim the cowboy came to the door. Do you think he came to my rescue? Do you think he ran for his gun and started shooting? Do you think he even lifted his voice to help his loyal dog, his head of ranch security? No, sir. He slapped his knee, threw back his head, and laughed. And then he said, Get him, Hanky. Sick him, boy. <laughs> well, I had never been so. After years and years of loyal, let's just say that this came as a bitter disappointment to me. It would have served him right if I'd been eaten by those two skeletons. That would have left their dumb old ranch defenseless. Well, the time had come for me to fall back to another position. Or, to put it another way, to run for my life. <laughs> At last, my claws got traction on the sidewalk, and I went zooming away from this collection of goblins, spooks, and crazy people. No ordinary dog could have... The only trouble was that I forgot to jump when I came to the fence. <laughs> Yes, my mind was on other things, and boy, did I come to a sudden stop. Center punched that dadgum fence, and liked to have broke my nose off at the roots. Well, I bounced off the fence, backed off and took another run at it, and this time went flying over the top. I don't know who parked the wheelbarrow over there. And I don't care, but it was a dumb place to park a wheelbarrow. I knocked it over, scrambled my feet, and escaped a terrible death by a matter of inches. It was then that I noticed that my legs were wet. Very strange, because I hadn't come in contact with any water whatsoever. Beat anything I ever saw. You may think that the scary part is over, but just wait until you find out what happened in the feed barn. Don't read that chapter unless you're pretty darn tough. <laughs>
take that challenge up, <coughs> might find that book in the library. So just give it a shot if you think you're pretty darn tough. <coughs> Number nine, the case of the Halloween ghost. Well, we've already met Madame Moonshine, the witchy little owl. She appeared again <coughs> in the Ten Tank story, Lost in the Dark and Enchanted Forest. Little Alfred runs away from home because his mother has brought home a baby from the hospital and it makes him mad. So he runs off into a wooded area which Hank calls the Dark Unchanted Forest. And he goes in, follows little Alfred's tracks in, and he promptly gets lost. As he's walking through this area of dark trees, he looks up or he hears a voice. And he looks up and he sees Madame Moonshine hanging upside down from a tree. She has gotten her foot caught in a grapevine and can't get down. And Hank tells her that she should use her magic powers to get herself down. And she says that she doesn't think she ought to do that because she's upside down and backwards and she's afraid her power might be upside down and backwards. Hank, who is an expert on almost everything, says, nah, don't worry about it. Use your powers and get yourself down. So she says a magic incantation, which ends with the words, reverse this scene entirely. And it does. It picks Hank up from the ground and hangs him upside down from the tree. He doesn't like it because it changes the way everything looks when you're hanging upside down. Madame Moonshine kind of likes it because she's a little weird. But they sing a song about it. And in this one, Fred has programmed his synthesizers to do a, a rhythm uh, track. And then he plays on another synthesizer with his real hands. It's called uh, Disorientation. And Hank does the first verse, and Madame Moonshine does the next verse, and then they go back and forth. So here is Disorientation. <laughs> There are uh, 
many different kinds of songs on the Hank stories, and uh, not all of them are sung by Hank. He does some of them. Some of them are silly songs. Some of them are not very pretty, like Rotten Meat. Uh, but I noticed after doing nine or ten of these songs that love was a theme that kept coming up over and over again. And we did sort of a love song in Rotten Me. But there are others. And we're going to close with a little medley of love songs. We'll do about three of them for you. The first one comes from the book I read from called Case the Halloween Ghost. In that song, Wallace and Junior the Buzzards make an appearance. Now, Wallace, or Junior, as you might recall, wants to be a singer when he grows up. His father doesn't like that idea at all. He says, he talks like this. Son, no self-respecting buzzard ever wanted to be a singer. So, they have this conflict, the father and the son. Nobody knows that uh, Wallace can even carry a tune until the ninth Hank story. And in the Halloween Ghost, Wallace suddenly bursts out with a song. And uh, it's a song about his youth when he was a young bird. And it's a song about love amongst the buzzards. And as you might guess, buzzards are kind of homely. And love amongst the buzzards is probably a hard luck kind of a deal. So, this is a song about hard luck romance. So here is Wallace the Buzzard making his singing debut singing Buzzard Love. Let's see, I forgot the words to this. When I was a young bird, a snaggle and a number, the handsomest buzzard you ever did see. The ladies all lined up and fought till they signed up to kiss me. Stay at the base of my tree. This one gal named Monique, she said that my technique was crude and stuck up and completely uncouth. She thought I was trying to impress them by lying, but shucks, I was trying to tell them the truth. Oh, buzzer love on the wings of a dove, you left me here behind. When I took up women, was like I was swimming, you throwed me a sinker instead of a line.
from that song, we'll go to one that makes an attempt to be a free song. There are some free songs in the Hank stories. This one comes from the case of the one I know, from the uh, Curse of the Incredible Crisis Corn Cob, number seven. Hank believes he's become a wealthy dog. He runs away from the ranch, and while he's up in the canyon country, he runs into a character that made her first appearance in the very first Hank story. Her proper coyote name is Girl Who Drink Blood. She is the lovely daughter of Chief Mini Rabbit Gut Eating Full Moon, who is the chief of the coyote band. She's a lovely coyote princess, in other words, and boy, how the old heart, Hank's heart really begins to beat when he sees her. And he often has fantasies about quitting his job and leaving all the responsibilities behind him, running away, joining the coyotes, becoming a cannibal, and marrying Miss Coyote. Well, he runs into her in this story, and they sing a song together. If you were listening to this song on one of the Hank's greatest hits tapes or on the story cassette, you would hear Hank sing the first verse and then Missy Coyote, sung by my wife Christine, would do the second verse, and then on the last verse, they do a duet. And I don't do duets well, so I'm going to do it by myself. It's called, oh, and Trev Tavis did the arrangement <coughs> on it, which I think is really a pretty one. It's called, My Heart Goes Wild For You. Let's see, we had a buzzard love song, and there was Hank singing to a coyote princess. 
Now we're going to have Riff and Snort singing about love amongst the cannibals. This comes from the Ten Thanks story, Every Dog Has His Day, and Snort and Riff sing this one. It's about how their mom and dad met and fell in love and got married and so forth. And uh, it's kind of special because, oh, before I mention that, some of you were interested in the 13th Hank book, and it did not come in by the time we left Perryton. It'll probably be there Tuesday when we get home. Uh, so if you would like to order a copy, write your name down on a piece of paper, and uh, we'll let you know when it gets in. If you want us to just mail you a copy, go ahead and pay for it, and we'll mail it to you and pay the postage. All right. Rip and Snort are singing about how their mom and dad met and fell in love and got married. And they do it with this song. Snort does the singing, and as we found in the Rotten Meat song, he, he misses a note or two, but he tries real hard. But it's special because his brother Rip, in the middle of this song, sing, or plays a trombone, coyote trombone solo. I don't know whether y'all have coyote trombones down here. So this could be a real treat for you. A lot of people just, uh, all they have tears dripping down their cheeks at the end of the song. It's really moving. So we're going to close on this one. It's been great fun being with y'all in Kingsville. And uh, we're going to close with Daddy packed his suitcase because Mama was a mean old bag. Pretty far.